now looking at Revelation chapter 13. And to begin this, I'd like to read the last phrase of chapter 12. Uh, remember, when the book of Revelation, or excuse me, any book in the New Testament written, it was not written with chapters and verses in it. They came later. And uh, in hindsight, I think we could do a lot better with the chapters and the verses, but we don't get hindsight. They're never going to change, and so we're going to have to live with them. And the last phrase in chapter 12 it says this, And he, that is the uh, beast, stood on the sand of the sea. And then you'll notice the next phrase, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. So you see the connection between those two phrases, and I think they are connected. And it creates for us a new direction that I think the book is going. Up to this point, we've been focusing primarily on the land of Israel and the things that were happening there. And we saw in chapter 12 how the devil was thwarted in his plans to accomplish certain things for the people of God, who were protected by God, and uh, the Jewish church, 144,000, those that responded to Christ's teaching that when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, they were to flee, and they did flee. And Satan was not uh, allowed to uh, do anything to them. And in frustration, he turns from uh, this area, Israel, and he's on, uh, standing on the sand of the sea. Now that puts him basically facing west. And it puts him facing right square down the Mediterranean Sea, the Roman Empire, and his focus and his look. Do you see that without me showing you a map? Can you envision that? But that's exactly where he's at in Israel, standing on the sea, puts you just you know, virtually directly east of the Straits of Gibraltar or facing directly west to the Straits of Gibraltar and looking at the Mediterranean, the Roman world. And I saw beasts rising out of the sea. Now, the sea is often used in the scripture as the Gentile world. And so we see a beast rising out of the Gentile world. And he has and ten horns with seven heads. This is identical to, to the, uh, the dragon in the last chapter. And the, and the dragon also had ten, horns, uh, ten he, uh, horns and seven heads. And I think the meaning is the same, virtually the same, in that horns is a symbol of power. And uh, it has been from the ancient world. And that's, it, and that's why the Vikings, you know, go around with those little hats on with the horns on them, because symbolic of their military powers, their military power. And, uh, and this uh, beast has ten horns, ten being, I think, taken from the, uh, the hands. A person with uh, ten fingers is a person who could do the job that he's required to do. If he had less than that, then he was limited in his power and his ability. And in a world in which there were few machines, uh, when things got done, it got done by your own power. Uh, so here we have a, another beast, powerful uh, in his character. Any questions as we go? With ten diadems on his horns. Now, the prior beast had seven diadems, who was Satan. This one has ten diadems. Does this make this particular beast even more regal than Satan himself? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. Uh, we're dealing with the world of symbolism. So what is the symbolism here of ten diadems uh, that are on these ten horns? Well, we'll I think we'll come to read and uh, understand that these horns, uh, these diadems, represented monarchs across the Mediterranean worlds. Similar to Herod, which was preached on this morning. He was a monarch. He was a king in Israel at one time. And, and there were basically 
ten provinces under the Roman rule. And these provinces had leaders of some type, kings of some type. And that <clears throat> these uh, ten kings gave their power to the central king, the emperor uh, of the Roman Empire. And we also read in blasphemous, blasphemous names on its heads. Uh, the word blasphemy is a word that is particularly unique to the Jewish culture. And, it, and its meaning in a Jewish book would, would take reference to the fact that somebody in some way, shape, or form is demeaning the God of heaven, the Jewish God, Yahweh, and things they say things they do. Now these are uh, blasphemous names on its head. And those names uh, would uh, probably be uh, names that would reflect deity and, and giving deity to someone else other than the God of heaven. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet was like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. If we'll just take a second and take a look at Daniel chapter uh, 7, we will uh, be introduced to this picture again. In fact, Daniel chapter 7 and uh, Revelation chapter 13 sort of go hand in blood. In fact, we take a look at verse 2, Daniel chapter 7, we read, Daniel declared, I saw in my night vision and my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And of course, again, the Gentile world. And, and how did we start uh, Revelation 13, verse 1? This beast rising out of the sea. You can see the parallels here. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like the lion, that is the Babylonian Empire had eagle's wings. Then I looked and its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. If you're familiar with the stories of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, that will ring familiar to you. A man who was given the heart and the mind of an animal for so many years and now is lifted up on his feet like a man and his reason is given back to him again. And behold, another beast, one like a bear, was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Uh, this is the Medo-Persian Empire. Raised up on one side shows the power, the uh, out-of-proportion power, of the Persian portion of the Medo-Persian Empire. The uh, Medo-Persian portion being a smaller, less influential, and eventually one that fades under the influence of the Persian, which is today the Iranian uh, nation of Iran. Uh, <clears throat> it has three uh, uh, ribs. ribs. <laughs> That's right. I was going to say bones. It has three ribs <laughs> in its mouth, probably referring to uh, things like that uh, it's conquering Egypt, it's conquering Babylon, it's conquering uh, one other nation that uh, I can't put my finger on right off. Uh, but there were major empires that it conquered, uh, and uh, that's probably descriptive of that. Greece? Pardon me? Greek Empire? It didn't conquer Greece. Uh, uh, that got it in its, that's the reason it got in so much trouble later, it tried and failed. And uh, the Greeks were always pretty upset thereafter, and eventually there was a thing called payback. That, uh, <laughs> Occurred, and we're going to read about payback. And this beast uh, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and behold another like a leopard. Oh, payback time. Uh, <clears throat> with four wings of uh, uh, a bird on its back. The wings, of course, are symbolic of the great speed that uh, Alexander the Great uh, evidenced as he uh, moved through the, this uh, uh, Persian, Medo Persian Empire, destroying. Uh, the beast had four heads 
and dominion was given to it. Uh, when Alexander died, that his empire broke up into four empires. Uh, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. This fourth beast is given no animal counterpart. You'll notice. Uh, zero. It just says, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. Had great iron teeth that devoured and broke in pieces and stamped, stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that was before it. It had ten horns. Hello. You see. Uh, th this Revelation 13 and this uh, picture right here are one and the same thing. And so the creature in Revelation 13 takes these three animal parts and brings them together as the one great beast with the features and the powers and the abilities of all of them. And he is a terrifying beast. And Daniel, when he sees this beast, he is particularly amazed at this last beast and asks for additional information because it's the most terrifying of them all. Uh, and to it, I'm back now in Revelation chapter 13 and in the middle of verse 2. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. The dragon, of course, is Satan. And this uh, world empire is a tool of Satan in a very unique way. I, I, I suppose any uh, non can I say, Christian empire is a tool of Satan. But this one was a particularly uh, vicious, destructive, and terrifying tool. It's described in Daniel and in Revelation. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but his mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now, the, the heads, of course, I don't think I mentioned it, the heads would refer to the seven uh, emperors that uh, ruled the Roman Empire. I gave you a, a list of them. Uh, the first, obviously, was Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius was uh, emperor or Caesar when Jesus was born. Uh, Gaius Caligula, known as a madman. Claudius. And then uh, we come to uh, Caesar Nero, who was reigning at this period of time chronologically, in the Roman Empire. Now, the thing about <coughs> Nero was that uh, he committed suicide. He committed suicide because he was getting ready to be killed. And uh, he, I guess he didn't want the torture and the humiliation and everything associated with that death, so he took his own life. But when he did, the Roman Empire went into convulsions. And we had a year that followed, known as the year of the three emperors. And this was a year in which uh, the Roman Empire was at civil war. And the empire was on the verge of failing, breaking up into those ten parts we talked about. And as it did later, some hundreds of years later, when the empire did fall and break up into various parts all across Europe, Africa, the Middle East, all of those parts broke off and became independent nations. It was thought at this point in time that's exactly what was happening to uh, the Roman Empire. Now, in hindsight, we, we, we don't see it, but we weren't there, and we didn't experience what they experienced. And those that were there saw the Empire as having suffered a terrible wound and, and one not likely to survive. Uh, in my notes, I say, Tacitus says, this was the condition of the Roman state when Cyrus Gulba, chosen counsel for the second time, and his colleague Titus Vinius entered upon the year that was to be for Gulba, he was one of the emperors, his last, and for the state, almost the end. Now here's a person who was right there in the middle of it, historically, observing the Civil War, and who, like so many, thought, it's the end. The empire is falling, and it's crumbling, and it's coming apart, and this is the end. And so I'm suggesting to you here that its mortal wound was healed uh, refers to the fact that the empire comes 
unexpectedly back together and survives this uh, wound, not only to, you might say, the death of Nero, but the whole civil war that followed represented this, this wound that was healed when the empire uh, uh, under uh, Vespasian uh, got its act, so to speak, together again and survived. Any questions on any of this? And they, uh, these uh, citizens of the Roman Empire in these uh, ten areas, they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, uh, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against them? Nobody with any sense could fight against Rome at this period of time. They were indestructible. They didn't lose wars. And that was the opinion that's being expressed right here. Who can fight against Rome? Nobody. And then the Jews thought, well, we'll give it a shot. That didn't work out well, you see. And so <laughs> they, like everybody else who attempted it, were utterly crushed and destroyed. Uh, that was the typical response of the Romans. If you uh, did something like this, you didn't just fight a bit and sign a peace treaty. They, like... Daniel said they just stomped you into the ground. You so see, that was the nature of their response. <clears throat> and uh, going to verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now notice it was given. Uh, <clears throat> we, we know this. We have to be reminded Satan can do what he can do or his servants, the Roman Empire, can do what they can do because God gives them the authority and power to do that. Just as Satan desired Job and couldn't touch him until God told him what he could do. And he set limits. And he moved the limits, so to speak, allowing Satan to do more. But until God did move the limits, he was powerless. And so Satan is powerless until... He is given power. He's given a mouth to utter haughty and blasphemous words. Now, I think the haughty and blasphemous words are the, the uh, <clears throat> descriptions of deity that the Roman emperors uh, set for themselves. They call themselves God. They call themselves Savior. They call themselves Lords of the Earth, things of this nature. They had temples erected so that you could worship them. Now, it was a tradition of the Roman Empire in some years past to worship emperors that had died. But now they had moved to the point where the emperors wanted to be worshipped while still alive, you see. Well, of course, worshipping them dead or alive is sinful and blasphemous. Uh, and the words that they would have ascribed um, in these temples or on their uh, thrones or on their diadems, all of this would be blasphemy in the eyes of God. And notice it was given, or allowed to, notice the word allowed, it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now we've talked about the 42 months many times, and I'm going to throw you a curveball here, and I'm going to suggest to you that this is a different 42-month period, which is not particularly unusual, uh, if you're a student of the book of Daniel, and Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Jeremiah, and all of those 70 uh, uh, weeks of Daniel, and you'll, you'll know or remember that uh, people have a hard time figuring out how to apply those 70 weeks to the uh, uh, history of Israel. They're not sure of the starting dates, and they're not sure... Uh, if there's not uh, weeks being spoken of that's overlapping and things of this nature. Now it's possible that the 42 weeks here are spoken of are the same, and those would be 42 weeks in reference to Israel. But my issue here is we're not talking about Israel. We're talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking about the Christians in the Roman Empire. We have a new audience, a new direction, and a new line of thinking. So what 42 months, uh, if it's different, could we be addressing that would reflect the uh, uh, Nero, for instance, and the Christian community in Rome? You are familiar.
familiar with the burning of Rome. Uh, most people are. And as, you know, some, some people suggest uh, Nero did this in order that he might clear out the uh, a wooden city uh, of slums and rebuild it with uh, marble and the uh, uh, image that he had for this imperial city. He may or may not have done that. I don't think he was disappointed that it burned because, again, this allowed him to do some things uh, architecturally that he wanted to do. But he did get blamed for it, whether he did it or not. And he, uh, uh, you know, wanted to divert the, the pressure and the attention from himself, if you remember that. And what did he do? Who did he blame for this? He blamed the Christians in Rome, and he began to murder them. He, he uh, uh, would uh, nail them to crosses in his gardens, where he had parties. He would douse them with pitch and tar, it says, like, and set them on fire that they might serve as light for his evening parties. You see, instead of common lamps, he did this. He would sew them up in animal skins so that, you know, the, the smell and such like of the animal skins. And then he would unleash packs of dogs on them. And this is the types of things Nero did. Some of the worst imaginable, most brutal things he did. Now, in fact, he began to do that in November of 64, uh, right after Rome burned, and of course it stopped when he died in June of 68. Anybody want to count the months? Guess how many months that is? 42, 42 months. And so this is a 42 month period that reflects what's going on in the Roman Empire and in the Christian community where the context of the chapter appears to be placing up. Now these are people who are in Rome, uh, Christians who are in Rome, people in Jerusalem that are still in Pella at this point? Yes, the Christians uh, escaped. From uh, Jerusalem were in Pella? Yes. But these are Roman Christians you're talking about? These are Roman Christians. That's why I remember they have this picture of uh, the beast uh, uh, standing on a seashore looking west and, this, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and then another beast rising out of the sea in the Roman world. And then uh, that's where we're discussing this beast that rose up out of the sea and the things that he has done and is doing. And so I think you can make a case that this 42 months is a different 42 months, although there's overlap, you know, but it's a different audience. It's two different people being discussed. Uh, the Jewish people are, are suffering for 42 months because of their sin. The Christians are suffering for 42 months because of Nero's sin and not their own. But it's two different audiences being addressed. And if you, if you follow, as I hope you have been carefully as we've unpacked the story, I think you can go there. You can say, yeah, I see that happening. I see the audience changing. I see new personages being uh, discussed, uh, the beast, uh, the Roman emperors, and such like. Well, who was emperor during the um, destruction of Rome in the AD 70? Uh, that, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it would be uh, Nero still. No, no, Nero died in 68, June of 68. Vespasian, uh, was Vespasian had uh, taken the crown by then yeah. and assigned the final destruction of Jerusalem to his son Titus. That's right, be Vespasian. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Titus eventually himself follows as emperor as well. But remember, you have the year of the three emperors, which are listed in which they are uh, successively murdered. And uh, this internal revolution, these armies, these legions that are fighting each other and fighting the enemies of Rome. You could unpack this revolution, the civil war, and you, and you would find out from Great Britain to Israel and all points in between, the Roman Empire was in war, sometimes with itself sometimes with other enemies, you see. There was a great, uh, humongous uprising of tribes in Great Britain at this time that Rome was trying to deal with. You know, very uh, uh, difficult time for Rome. Uh, and it was all across the Roman Empire this was happening. And that's the reason 
that that Roman citizen, that Tacitus, who was a famed historian, thought, well, it, it's coming apart. Everywhere, every providence, it's coming apart. And here, and then we have Nero dying, and then you, and he died because there was a civil war that, in essence, was killing him. And then you have the next year of emperors fighting and dying. It was just a disaster. And that's the picture painted, I think, in the scriptures here. So I'm giving you a little bit different or some interesting information on the 42 months, not being the same 42 months. The, uh, the 42 months in Israel was from February 67 when Nero issues the order to destroy uh, Israel. And that's completed by August of the year 70, 42 months. And so there's overlap period, but two different people are being discussed. Verse 6. Yet this beast opened its mouth to uh, utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And so the beast, uh, uh, again, was determined that all would worship it and any other gods unless they were secondary gods, which they would tolerate in the pantheon, uh, were to be attacked and blasphemed. <clears throat> Verse 7. And it was allowed, again, you see the word allowed, to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Well, what did happen those 42 months? Nero made war on the saints, and he conquered them in the providence of God. And tens of thousands were murdered. We don't know how many, but we do have some writers in the church uh, in the, that century telling us that Christianity was nearly wiped out in Rome. It was so, and Rome, by the way, had a huge Christian church at this time. Very large, tens of thousands of members already. And there were nearly wiped out. Now fortunately, in the providence of God, this persecution did not extend beyond Rome. Because, you know, there are Christians all over the empire. Uh, but uh, it was devastating in Rome at this time. We go on to read, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on the earth to worship it. Now, <coughs> Uh, again, the use of the terms here, tribe and nation and uh, you know, the whole world and everything, you can see this is the complete and full Roman Empire. They were under attack, internal revolution, but authority was given to it to win, so to speak, and bring all of these provinces back into subjection and to rule uh, firmly at this time. Any questions about that? Authority was given it over the Mediterranean world. And then we go on to read, and uh, this is, uh, everyone worshipped it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. And so there is a limitation to who does the worshipping, and those that are believers are not worshiping. And for that reason, they are dying because they refuse to worship Caesar and say Caesar is Lord. It's hard for us in our era, the 21st century, to grasp what was required to stay alive. It was simply this. Just take a glass of wine. It wasn't grape juice. <laughs> take a glass of wine and pour it at the altar of some pagan temple and say, uh, Caesar is Lord. Okay, you pass next. That was it, and you lived. And thousands and tens of thousands said, no, I will not do that. And you realize you'll die. Yes, I realize I'll die. And they died. To me, it's just amazing how simple it would have been to live and how utterly determined they were that only Jesus Christ be called Lord and nobody else. And so they died for that. 
<laughs> Notice also it says that everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. Now I'd like to suggest to you that this whole argument of Reformed theology as to, you know, you say it in a lot of different ways, but what's involved in getting saved, you know, the role you play and the role God plays, you know, God casts the vote, Satan casts the vote, and then the final vote is put in your hands. Now, you realize I'm making a joke here. and You can't be sure. <laughs> Some people may actually think I'm teaching that. I'm not teaching that. I'm telling you that pastors and churches all over the world teach that. It's called Arminianism. And that is how people get saved. They make the choice. What does this passage say? Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God has made the choice. When did he do it? In the last few days? Or the day that you came to faith in Christ? No, before the foundation of the world. In eternity past, before there was a world. God determined on the salvation of your soul. Now, is there anything else to discuss about Arminianism or Calvinism? Or what? No! That's resolved in that one verse. Now, you may have uh, different opinions than I do, but I don't see that there is any scripture that justifies God being other, anything other than the, the totality of what is involved or takes for a man to become a believer. It's his choice. Now, keep in mind the word choice is the Greek word electos. That's not for me. It's the word election. We talk about people hate the word election. And notwithstanding the fact that the Bible is constantly talking about God choosing or electing. That's what elect means, choosing. God is chosen. God is elected before the foundation of the world, his church. Questions? Comments? How to teach this to a bunch of Baptists, I get more response. I'm not getting anything out of you. you know. I'm looking for a good argument here. <laughs> get run out of the rail. He's preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. Okay. And so... Those that were chosen, and you'll uh, look with me at Ephesians 1, uh, 1 and verse 4 in just a second. And here we read, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Nothing new, it's just written by Paul, this is written by John, they're using the same vocabulary. Apparently, this type of phrase, this type of thinking, was common in the church. So the two distinct individuals uh, with unique and different backgrounds, like Paul and John, are saying almost identical the same words. The same. And that is the teaching of Scripture, and should be the teaching of the Orthodox Church. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken into captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. This verse right there has caused me all sorts of headaches this week. <laughs> and uh, why? Because there are three potential audiences to which this is speaking. First of all, Let's note that this is a very negative comment. And it comes out of Jeremiah 15.2, which we can quickly look at. Uh, Jeremiah 15.2. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight. Let them go. And when they ask you, here's the people of Jerusalem. God says, and when these people of Jerusalem ask you, where shall we go? You shall say to them, thus saith the Lord, 
those who are for pestilence to pestilence, those who are for the sword to the sword, those who are for famine to famine, and those who are for captivity to captivity. These are, he was, you know, these are not warm and fuzzy words here, you know. He said the people are saying, we're in trouble, give us some advice, what do we do? He said, well, you go to pestilence, go to famine, go to sword, go to captivity, whatever. You got any better options, <laughs> you know. No, those are the only options they're given. It's a very, very negative verse. You see the context. It's important, obviously, context is everything. And so you bring it back into the book of Revelation, and John is quoting this passage. And, you know, who is the audience that he is referring to? There are three possibilities. One, he's talking to the Jews, you know, those who had de uh, denied Christ, their city was being besieged, they were going... They were expecting pestilence, or they are experiencing pestilence. They were experiencing famine. They were experiencing the sword. And they were soon to experience uh, captivity. That seemed to fit them very well, if you look for a negative application. But my question to myself and to you is, but the context of Revelation chapter 13, we're not talking about Jews. We're talking about Gentiles. We're talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking about the Christians in the Roman Empire. That Jewish audience in Jerusalem, 1,500 miles away, is not the audience that we're discussing right here at this point. You see my dilemma? Well, then you've got another possibility. There must be to the Romans, these evil people that are persecuting the church because... Certainly, they deserve this negative uh, uh, prophecy and condemnation. Uh, but the problem is, the Romans weren't starving. They weren't suffering. They weren't experiencing pestilence. They weren't experiencing the sword. And they weren't being taken into captivity. The only way that it could apply to them would be prophetically from, as the Roman Empire fell apart in, you know, the fourth, fifth, sixth century. But in the first century, it has no application to Rome. You, you, is, your, is your dilemma growing with mine? Did I dis discuss this with you? Now, what is the third possibility? Let's finish up the verse in a little bit and you'll see it. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. You have this negative comment and then you say, now, this is a call for endurance and faith of the saints. The saints, that's the last person I thought we'd be talking about in this context. <clears throat> Yet in verse 7, also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. The whole flow of the passage, conquering the saints and, and everything, and then finishing up, this is the endurance of the saints and faith. It really is like an ironclad context that this negative prophecy is in some way or another being used of John to refer to those believers in the first century, especially in Rome, who suffered under Nero. That's, that seems to me, you know, now I might point out, I didn't, that's not the way I wrote it up in my book. But, but, but as I study this every week, I'm doing my best to do something other than regurgitate my book. Uh, and you've if you read my book, you notice sometimes how different and fresh, I hope, the material strikes you that I'm sharing with you. And so, <clears throat> this is not the position I took when I wrote the book. I said it was the Jewish you know, people in Jerusalem, because it certainly fits what they're experiencing, and yet in some way it fits what the church is experiencing in Rome right now under Nero. And although it's said in the most negative fashion, and I do would think, you know, I wish God was a little bit more. Now we got another beast we're being exposed to. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, it, uh, and it spoke like a dragon. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, there's a difference in this uh, uh, beast. And uh, it says two horns like a dragon, not a uh, like a lamb. Now, the fact of the matter is, all lambs have two horns. And so what's the point of saying it had two horns like a lamb? I think the point really is to make some distinction between this vicious beast with uh, 
these ten horns and this hor horrible description of its destructiveness and another beast which is in and of itself not real powerful. I mean, it's like, you know, two horns, a little bit of authority. And uh, it's not a vicious leopard or a lion or something. It's just a lamb. Now, what we have here, we'll actually find out this a little bit later, chapter 17, I believe. We have here the false prophet. What we have. And, you know, uh, a religion plays the role of a lamb. Christianity does, Christ did, but a lot of the religions pretend to be harmless, even though they may be very harmful. But they put on a show of being meek and mind, uh, mild and kind. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have here a religious uh, element uh, at this point, and we know this but later in the book of Revelation. It says it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, okay, uh, or on its behalf, depending on the translation. But they say about the same. And so it gets its authority, not in, a, in and of itself with its two little horns. It gets its authority from the Roman Empire. Okay? Before we go any further, and you'll probably bring this up later, but to help me with my understanding, are you saying or thinking that this beast is a symbol of a of a movement or a person? Which beast? The, beast the second beast. Huh? The second beast. The second beast. The symbolic one. Symbolic of a movement or a thought process or of a person. This second beast starting in verse 11? Yeah. Okay. Who is that second beast? It's, it's a, okay. Uh, well, we'll unpack this as we go. I'd say it's the, it's the religious priesthood okay. of the Roman Empire. Now, you have read my book. Notice I said it's the religious priesthood of the uh, Jewish empire. I changed my opinion. Okay. <laughs> you know? And why did I change my opinion? Uh, now, I, I might add that a lot of commentators say it is a religious system of the Jewish empire. They agree. But as I read it, what is the thing I've, I've been stressing I like to try to do so often? Keep it in context. What's the context? It's the Roman world. You follow what I'm trying to say? And if, and if there's not a reason for me to jump out of this world and address Judaism again, until I get a reason, I'm inclined to, you know, to try to interpret everything said in terms of where I found myself, uh, which was in the Roman world and in Rome, you say. So... <coughs> It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. That's its role as a priesthood. You see, it creates the ceremonies. Uh, it creates the religious trinkets. It creates the idols. It creates the temples. And all of this it uses to focus the population on <coughs> the Roman emperor and the Roman empire. Does that make sense to you? Okay, it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And so this is the Roman Empire. It's worshiping the Roman Emperor and its Roman Empress. It performs great signs, even making fires come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Now, as, as magnificent as that sounds to you and I, uh, you know, even in a technologically sophisticated world, you'd be surprised how common that was in that era. So common that if we'll go back to Elijah on Mount Carmel, when he tells the prophet the male, you build an altar and put your sacrifice on it. I'll build an altar, altar to Jehovah and I'll put my sacrifice on it. And then he says to what? To, and uh, be careful you don't put a fire under it. And just to be safe, let's just dump a couple hundred gallons or more of water on it until... It's soaked down, it's overflowing the trench around it, just to make sure, keep everybody, you know, honest, you see. And then Elijah calls down, down fire from heaven to his sacrifice. Sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the water, everything, woo, gone, you know. And th this type of thing was recognized as Elijah and the prophet, the better by reckoning, uh, as being uh, dem demonstrative or, uh, in some sense, uh, providing.
providing uh, unquestioned proof of who is God, you see. And in fact, this happened earlier in the, in the history of Israel when um, Moses uh, com uh, uh, completed the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. They got all the parts out, they got everything ready, and they got the uh, uh, altar all set up, ready to go, and they put an animal on it, and what, how did that, what happened? Fire fell from heaven in that story, consumed uh, that animal, and, uh, and started the fire that was on that altar. And they said that the Jews kept that fire alive thereafter for hundreds of years. And they say they kept it alive until the Babylonian uh, exile. That one fire that never let go out, that was the fire from God. And that to them was, uh, you know, I mean, how often do you get that fire? <laughs> and so they kept that fire going. There's even foolish traditions that the fire was preserved through the Babylonian exile in some hole or cave in the ground or something. If you read the uh, apocryphal books, you'll read about it. Uh, but it's just foolishness. At some point, that fire went out, and that would be, of course, a point. But fire from heaven authenticates uh, your message. Okay. And I've already shown you a, a situation that goes back about uh, 900 B.C., somewhere around there at Elijah, and, and how common it was uh, to create images of this. You know, you get something, a little fire going, and I don't know what knowledge, I know, we all know they had some knowledge. We don't know what knowledge of chemistry and such like they had, but my best guess is where they're dancing around the fire cutting themselves, uh, certain people are reaching in their pocket and throwing things on the fire. Woof! Up it goes, you know. Ah, God, you know, is answered by fire. But that's not hard to imagine, is it? You know, yeah, if you know the right chemistry uh, to make this happen, you say. And uh, Elijah messed it all up by filling it up with water, and that didn't work. So, my point is there's traditions of this for hundreds and thousands of years. And those traditions continued in the Roman Empire. And there were tricksters, and always were from, from the uh, priest in Egypt that imitated the uh, uh, miracles of uh, Moses. It's like you need more fleas, you know. You need more frogs, you know. You know you're not helping. <laughs> you know. Could you do, you know, a different miracle? You know, take some away. Uh, but they imitated uh, the, uh, uh, these uh, real miracles. And so they continued to be frauds and imitators. And, and, and Christ spoke of this crowd, did he not? For false Christ and prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. And... Uh, also, uh, we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. You see, this is all pr pr prophesied. <coughs> and then we <coughs> read Acts 8, 90. No, that, I don't think that 99 is right there. Acts 8, something or another. And there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. So they're practicing a magic and signs of this nature. My point is common, 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 you see. Acts 16, it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune telling. Magic of various kinds. Uh, so, this was a common uh, experience uh, in this ancient world. It's somewhat common today as well. Uh, it's common in churches with the, with the uh, fraudulent miracles that take place. And it's also common uh, in the, the world as a whole. You know, the... Uh, crop circles and the uh, people from 
from outer space that come down and do, you know, UFOs. UFOs and it just, I was reading something that, uh, the other day that says, who's, who is more likely, less likely to believe in things like UFOs and crop circles? If you have no Christian training, you're very much likely to believe in it. If you are a believer and you know, ascribe to scriptures, your likelihood of it, embracing that is very low. Is that? And uh, I can testify from personal experience. I've always thought it was just utter stupidity. Uh, and I guess it's my utter conviction of the revelation of God in Scripture as to what is real and false uh, has uh, inclined me to think that way. So I just want to make the point that is is. Miraculous as this sounds, we're talking tricks. Yeah. Um, for a great sign, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the sign that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Uh, we have uh, historical documents that talk about uh, uh, religious idols that were constructed in such a way uh, that its parts moved and they had a tube running through the mouth down to the basement someplace where guys down there talking in it and it's voice comes out as the heads move, hands move, you know. Fraudulent uh, miracles. And uh, I don't know, if you've seen Star Wars, that probably wouldn't go down, but <laughs> you know, if you hadn't seen Star Wars, you know, like, oh wow, look at that, you know. And simple uneducated people uh, are buying that stuff. So and they, so, had, they even had coin-operated uh, miracles back then. It was they've actually dug them up. I mean, ancient Greece put a coin, and you know it would do some simple thing we would think today, but mechanical things like that were pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Then. Yeah, wait till the Pentecostals find out about that. I'll put them in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Special 
forces or something that, that they would uh, get these fat fish. And they wouldn't say ma. Um, <laughs> you know, they'd say something else. You know, something that would suggest the military significance of it. Uh, tattoos were common. Branding was common. Uh, branding of slaves, for instance. And uh, one of the ways to get yourself branded on the face was, as a slave, to run away. And say, well, if you're going to do that, then they would brand you on the cheek or on the forehead. Uh, in essence, you're, you know, the trust we had in you to, to do your job, so to speak, here in work, is it, gone. So now we're going to make it easy for anybody to know you're a run, runaway slave. You see, you see the point. And so people, uh, slaves were often branded uh, on the face uh, to identify them as a slave, if, especially if they were problematic to their own. Now, <clears throat> the Bible talks about branding. Circumcision is a, is a cutting of the flesh that identifies people as the community of faith. That's just what, in this line of thinking that is uh, a part of that thinking. Uh, there are <coughs> invisible uh, brandings. Uh, the Bible calls them, uh, our baptism, a seal of our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not something that we can see, but it is something God can see. The 144,000 were marked invisibly, so to speak, on their hand and their forehead as the community of faith. Now, if they're marked invisibly, what's the point? Well, the point is, in the spiritual world, everybody can see those marks. Whether they're the angels of God or the demons of hell, all carry marks that are visible in the spiritual world, as actually we do as well. And uh, so the point is, here is that uh, this community is being stressed. Uh, they, uh, they bore the mark of, of Satan and identified with him. Now, other possibilities ex exist. Uh, it's the, you know, it talks about the name here. Uh, the, the mark is a name. Uh, names were put on money, uh, the emperor's name. And uh, that is a... A, uh, you know, part of the tradition, so to speak, of, of identifying ownership. Uh, in addition, we talked about sacrifice earlier in the first century. When you did sacrifice, you received a receipt. They were very sophisticated. You received a receipt. And guess who's... Uh, what is the seal? seal. What's that? Seal. Se well, seal, you know, it's a, yeah, that's right, a seal, uh, uh, an official uh, seal of, from the empire, the emperor. Uh, I guess his seal would be, it would be the emperor and his name, you see. It, um, and, you know, you would want to keep that <coughs> to prove that you were loyal and you were not a Christian. Because if you didn't have it, you were done, uh, potentially. And not only that, you needed to prove who you were in order to buy and sell in the marketplace. In, you may or may not know this, in Palestine in the first century after the resurrection, multitudes came to faith in Christ. The Jewish community refused to, uh, to buy or sell from the Christians. Did you, you might not tell you that? Uh, Christians were in a bad way. You couldn't go to the market. You go to the market, you stand in the vegetable booth to buy something, and they will look at you if they know you're a Christian. And you couldn't buy anything. And if you, if you, you know, crash and you made something, nobody's interested in buying it from you. Uh, that puts you in a very bad situation. Did you know that all across Palestine in the first century, Christian communities grew up, and that everybody in that community was a Christian? And they, in essence, Christians had to move out of the cities, villages they lived in, or they couldn't live. They couldn't
couldn't survive. They couldn't eat. And they congregated into new areas where they could buy and sell from each other in order to survive. Did you know that? Did you know, this I know you know, that Paul was constantly taking up offerings to send to these people that were being so horribly persecuted by their brothers, the, the, the uh, Jewish brothers, because of these issues like buying and selling. And they needed help to survive. He wasn't taking up offerings for, you know, uh, Asia Minor, for Rome, or any place like that, because the greatest, most vicious, most murderous enemy in the first century before 8070 was at, Judaism. Judaism. Judaism hated Christians with a hate that's indescribable. And that's why they would not buy or sell from them. These certificates allowed you to buy and sell in the marketplace. So, as that, um, you know, that uh, spread through the Roman world when Christianity fell out of favor, uh, they also had problems buying and selling uh, as well. So that's what I'm trying to tell you is the, I think, the historic explanation for the mark of the beast, which I think was quite invisible, uh, just like our mark in baptism. But I think everybody has one, you see. And uh, saved and unsaved. Uh, any questions about that? No, but I have another question about something else, may I? Oh, yes. Verse 14, you have talked about the significance of the phrase, he ordered the people of the earth to make a great statue of the first beast which made the wounded. What about the statue? Is there significance about the statue there? Well, statues were idols. And so this would be a special statue of some type for emperor worship purposes. Is it be a literal command, so to speak, or literal occurrence? Well, the priesthood would issue these commands with the approval of Nero and other emperors, you see. Because it was in their best interest to expand the priesthood because they expanded their wealth and their influence, you see. And so, you may not know this, but every community had a what we call today a council of churches in which uh, the representatives from the various temples and everything got together, it was a legal entity, so to speak, under Roman authority, in which they regulated the worship of that community. They had a special Latin name for what they were. But they were like a council of churches. And they decided, of course, how worship was to take place. And they all recognized that whatever their little god may have been, Apollo or this or that, they were all subservient to the emperor. So they all got together, and uh, emperor worship was the number one thing. So they built idols. And, and, and nobody had more statues of himself built than uh, Nero. He had, a he had one in Rome that's destroyed. It was supposed to, of himself, it was supposed to be 60 uh, feet tall or something, that, out of, I think, copper, very expensive. It reminds you, Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar did something very similar. You see. In fact, I think, again, De uh, Daniel and chapter 13, there's a lot of parallels here. That's just one of the parallels. A statue that you mentioned and that burns, in essence, comes right out of the book of Daniel. Now we've got quickly, uh, very quickly, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and it's number 666. First of all, let's take notice the number of a man. If more people would take note of that, they wouldn't go around looking at their social security number or right. multitudes of other things trying to figure out, you know, who has the mark of the beast. I don't know how many different ways pe people, uh, uh, you know, they talk about computers and like Belgium or something that has credit cards, credit cards, and oh my, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, got the mark of the beast. It's the number of a name, you know. First of all. Uh, that has a, you know, it still leads to several billion possibilities because there's a lot of people in the, in the world. But it doesn't allow computers and credit cards and social security numbers to be considered. You know what I'm and uh, if you do what I do, put it in the first century, you've got to find a person in the first century who was particularly the enemy of uh, Christianity, uh, 
uh, and ask yourself, is there a candidate? And there uh, is. Uh, that person would be Nero. Caesar Nero. Uh, and, and there's some, I'm not going to be real insistent. I'm just going to say Caesar Nero, uh, <coughs> spelled with Hebrew letters, is 666. Not Latin letters, but Hebrew letters. Can you explain the significance of uh, Hebrew and the numeric system that went with it? I don't know that I um, know where you're going. I thought that Hebrew was one of the only languages, if not the only language, where you could do this type of numeric. No, not really. It's called uh, gematria. And uh, no languages up until the Arabs gave us Arabic numbers had a numbering system. All languages used their alphabet for numbers. Latin did. And, uh, well, you've seen Latin uh, numbers in various places. Roman numerals. Uh, Roman numerals, yeah. There, there are letters of the alphabet, because they had no Arabic numbers, you're saying. But <clears throat> still, nevertheless, uh, Nero Caesar in Hebrew, uh, and, and this would be a, a, you know, a secretive thing. And, uh, you know, in Latin it doesn't work, in Hebrew it does. And can you figure out what this is about? And remember, a good portion of the church prior to AD 70 in Asia Minor were, were the great uh, the, um, Jewish converts. You know, Paul, he, he'd go to the synagogues first to preach the gospel. A lot of Christians came out of Judaism. Uh, what is more interesting, or, or very interesting, is the fact that there are manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, that don't say six. 66, they say 616. Why is that significant? Because if you add it up in uh, Latin, uh, letters, Nero of Caesar, it equals 616. Now think about that. Here you got some scribe sitting there and he's copying and he gets the this, this 666 and he knows who the Antichrist is or he knows who this creature is, it's Nero Caesar. And he knows, you add up the letters, 666, that's not right. You know, because he can add them up. He, it's 616. I mean, what, what am I, an idiot? So he writes 616 in the manuscript. I can, somebody made a mistake. I corrected it. You see what I'm trying to say? The mistake he made, or the error he made, is confirmation. Because in Latin or Hebrew, they both add up Nero Caesar. You see what I'm trying to say? That makes sense, but I just, or did I confuse you more? Yeah, I got confused a little more. <laughs> So you're well, saying? I'm saying Nero Caesar in Latin letters, uh, uh, Gematria, the adding up of the um, uh, letters and numbers, equals 616. And uh, some scribe who was making a copy, he's not Hebrew, doesn't know any Hebrew. You know, 100 years have passed, the church is thoroughly Latin or Greek. And he's reading that, and he knows who, who the... Uh, Antichrist is here, you know, and he knows that uh, 666 doesn't work in Latin. Well, it does work in Latin. 616, okay, somebody made a mistake, I'm going to correct it. Puts in 616 because he knows it's Nero. 616 is a fortunate sign proof. You see what I'm trying to say? That everybody's thinking of Nero, no matter what language you're working in, they're all thinking of Nero. Yeah. Uh, so, in my opinion, Nero is the one who gets the 616, the great, you know, enemy of the church in the first century. Any questions about that? Sorry, I kept you so long. This was longer than I thought.